then um, I might hand it over to some of my co-organizers uh, to allow them to introduce themselves. Maybe Mari Lu, starting with you. Sure, thank you so much, Maurizio. Hi guys, my name is Mary Lou Cristina Flores and I am the Regional Manager for the Surfrider Foundation in Florida and Puerto Rico. But I am also proud to represent Friends of Our Florida Reefs and Friends of Our Florida Reefs is a registered 501c3 nonprofit citizen support organization. We're dedicated to conserving and protecting over 100 miles of vital coral reefs, which are directly offshore in Southeast Florida between Miami-Dade and Martin counties. We're super excited to be here tonight. Thank you so much for your time. This is going to be a super fun class. Thank you, Maurizio and Shelby, for organizing this. For sure. And Shelby? Hey, everybody. My name is Shelby Wedlick. I'm with uh, DEP's Coral Reef Conservation Program. I focus on ways to reduce impacts of maritime industry and coastal construction on coral reefs. And I'm also going to be coming back around next Tuesday for Marine Invert ID Part 2. So excited to see you all here tonight. I'll be kind of helping um, if there are any questions that we don't get to. I'll try and kind of answer those in the background and I'm also a resource if you need anything else. Thanks again for joining us tonight. Really excited to learn more about marine inverts. Awesome, thanks. And folks, definitely check out next week. Um, there are lots of many cool animals that we won't get to today. Um, so, hi all, my name is Maurizio Martinelli. Um, I work for Florida Sea Grant, which is part of the University of Florida's extension programming. Um, I work on coral conservation in Florida, um, but today, instead of talking too much about uh, kind of conservation itself, um, what we have are a series of different presentations in the course of the month to celebrate Earth Month. So, first of all, happy Earth Month, everybody. Um, we really try to use this month to, you know, connect to nature in a way that we can, to remind ourselves of all the amazing things out there in the world, um, kind of aside from the human world that are out there for us to love and appreciate. And I know, especially over the past year, it's been difficult for a lot of us to connect to nature. And so my hope is with these kind of virtual presentations that we have, um, that it can be your little connection to nature if you've had, you know, difficulties getting out there. Um, so this is the first in a series of presentations. As Shelby mentioned, next Tuesday in the same time, we're going to have the second part of the Marine Invertebrate Identification course. But we also, throughout the month, have uh, courses related to fish identification, stony coral identification, uh, coral reef story time. Um, if you're interested in becoming you know, like a citizen scientist to report issues that you see out on the reef, there's a training course for that as well. Um, so please feel free to tune into those. They're intended to be kind of fun and easy and here to, you know, help celebrate Earth Month. But enough about me. Uh, the real star of our show today is the Florida Reef Tract. Oh, one thing. Does someone know how to record this? Oh, it's being recorded. Never mind. <laughs> All right. So um, here's a map of uh, Florida's coral reef. It's a reef tract that extends about 350 miles from Martin County up in the north, all the way down past the um, counties of Southeast Florida, hooking around the Biscayne Bay region, through the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary, and shooting out all the way to the Dry Tortugas region, um, kind of furthest southwest. Um, this 350 miles is about the equivalent of if you drove from Miami to Jacksonville. So the Floridians on the line should know that, that is not a small amount of area. Oh, and to put, a, I guess, a disembodied face to a disembodied voice, um, that's me. I'm Maurice Martinelli again, um, and I'm based out of Miami, Florida, again, working on coral conservation issues here. Um, so the Florida Reef Tract, or Florida's coral reefs that we have, is really an ecological wonder. Coral reefs in general are these amazing, amazing marine habitats that just house an insane amount of biodiversity. So coral reefs across all the world's oceans are a really tiny area. It's less than 1% of our oceans are coral reefs. But these coral reefs house about a quarter of all the marine species that we have. And so in many ways, we consider these coral reefs like the megacities of our ocean, because it is just this 
insane amount of biodiversity that's packed into such a small area. And Florida's coral reef is no different from any of those other areas. We have tons of different kinds of species, including lots of really cool and really important invertebrates. But more so than just its ecological value, especially here in Florida, there is a huge economic value to this reef system. So aside from all the things um, like the recreation that we do on these reefs, like fishing and diving and, and boating, um, they also serve to protect our coastlines. And so if you've been to South Florida or you live here, you know that we have a very, very, very developed coastline. And these, these coral reefs are really the first line of defense against the huge amount of energy um, that the ocean produces. So they protect us from waves and they protect us from flooding to the tune of hundreds of millions of dollars of infrastructures protected every single year from flooding. And when we have really, really intense storms, so something like an Irma comes through, they actually protect billions of dollars of infrastructure through prevented flooding. So these are absolutely vital to the economy and the well-being of South Florida. And so I like to emphasize that because it's not just that we care about all the really awesome creatures here, but we kind of also care about ourselves. Today, however, we're just going to be talking about some of the invertebrates that we find. So to start, we're going to talk about what even is an invertebrate and why I think you should care about them. We'll go over a very simplified phylogeny of the animal kingdom, which is just a way of saying how we organize all the different animals in the animal kingdom. And then the meat and potatoes, the main part of this presentation is going to be um, how to identify some of the common critters in four different phyla. So these are the phyla periphera, cnidaria, tenophora, and the last one that I can never pronounce, so I just say the flatworms. And if these mean nothing to you right now, awesome. My hope is that by the end of this presentation, these words will mean something to you, and maybe you'll even be excited um, when you see some of these critters out there. And then at the very end, we're going to have a very difficult and very important quiz. OK, to start off, what even is an invertebrate? Basically, it is any animal out there that either does not possess or at any point in their life develop a backbone. What that means is that all animals except for a subphylum vertebrata are included as invertebrates, which means it's every single animal except mammals like you and I, fish, amphibians, reptiles, and birds. So when you calculate that, it means that about 97% of the species that are out there are invertebrates. And so in many ways, this term invertebrate is much better describing what is not included rather than what is included. To, to kind of further this point a little bit, if you can kind of just consider the vertebrates as a phylum level, well, in the invertebrates, you have certain families and orders of animals that are more diverse and more complex with more animals in them than that subphylum of vertebrata. But even despite all of that, vertebrates get all the attention, and that's especially true in the world of conservation. When a lot of us think of environmental conservation, or at least of animals, you tend to think of the big things like the elephants and the tigers and the whales and the turtles. And those are absolutely worthy of our protection and our love and our respect, but so are these invertebrates. So many of these invertebrates are not just cool, but they're incredibly important to their ecosystems. They are things like the janitors of, of the coral reefs. They are things like uh, assisting in nutrient cycling so that things can keep growing out there. And many times they're also like the basis of the food webs that those larger animals rely on. So what I'm here today to do is almost to advocate on behalf of these invertebrates and hopefully tell you why you should be excited when you see these guys and why they are worthy of your attention and your respect and hopefully also your protection. So when we talk about organizing the animals, the basic idea behind evolutionary theory, and this is very, very simplified, is that if two animals have the same feature, it's very likely that they came from a common ancestor that has that feature. So when we think of those vertebrates, right, those, all these animals with the backbone, it's way, way, way more likely that we all came from a single ancestor that developed a backbone than if we all developed it independently. Now that's not always true. There are some cases where um, the same kind of feature was developed independently. There are some very, very cool examples of that, but um, that's definitely in the minority. So for the most part, the way that we organize animals is if they have these common features, we put them together in this group. And so I'm going to walk through what some of those big groups are with this little, you know, tree that represents the animal kingdom. So the basic idea here is that we all came from single-celled protozoan ancestors. 
And then the animal kingdom is where we have these creatures that develop this multicellularity. Um, so the very first group that developed from those single-celled organisms were the sponges um, or the phylum porifera. Sometime later, we had the cnidarians evolve, and this is your group of things like jellies and corals and sea anemones. Sometime later, we had um, a quite closely related group, but in a separate phylum, the tenophores or your comb jellies. Then we had the evolution of a couple different kind of worms, our flatworms and our roundworms. We had the evolution of the mollusks, so those are things like clams and mussels, but also things like sea snails and sea slugs, and also things like your squid and your octopuses. We had a different kind of worm evolve sometime later. These are your segmented worms. We had arthropods evolve. These are things in the ocean like um, crabs and lobsters and shrimp. These are the things with um, jointed appendages. On land, it's creatures like your bugs uh, and your spiders. We had the echinoderms evolve at one point, and these include things like your sea urchins and sea cucumbers. And then, of course, we have the chordates, which include all of those vertebrates. And so today during the course, we're just going to focus on some of the animals that are lower down on this evolutionary tree. And so what that means is that these were some of the first animals to evolve from those protozoan ancestors, or at least the ones that are still alive today. But because these were really early evolvers, they tend to be quite simple animals. And I don't mean simple in any you know, negative way. I don't mean it to be derogatory that they're, I think there's a real elegance to these simple animals because they kind of, they have uh, what they need to do in life and their bodies are just devoted to doing that. And so I hope today, you know, what I can impart on you is that a lot of people kind of think of these animals sometimes as like the background species. And um, so I really hope that once you learn a little bit more about them, that you might be more excited to see them. So you don't just think like, oh, that's a sponge out there. You're like, oh, wow, that's a sponge. And luckily for you, we are going to start with those sponges. So sponges are all the animals in the phylum porifera. Um, porifera is, as I mentioned, the kind of first still existing uh, group of animals that developed from those single cell proto protozoan ancestors. And what's really unique about these guys is that their cells are relatively independent. And so you can really tell how they came from those very independent single celled organisms to be this multicellular um, organism. This individuality of the different cells is still unique to this group. So whereas you and I, all the cells in our bodies, they, they really work closely together. You know, they form things together. They communicate together. Uh, the, the cells in these sponges don't really do that. They don't form any true tissue layers. They don't form any organs. They don't have any like circulatory or nervous systems, but they have sort of figured out some way to communicate with one another so that they can grow in, you know, certain kind of ways and sometimes even perform these actions, you know, certain actions together. One of the really fascinating things about sponges too is that they can grow in a whole host of different shapes and sizes and colors to the point that you have certain species of sponges that are, you know, exactly the same species, but they grow in completely different places, in completely different shapes, in completely different colors. So the sponges that I'll be talking about today and helping you identify are the ones that usually look a certain way. <laughs> and that way you don't have to worry about trying to figure out what, you know, what kind of sponge it is. When you see it, you'll know it. But now I mentioned that all, all of these five, all these groups of animals have common features. And so the common features of these sponges is really this pore bearer. So the basic, the basic organization of sponges looks like one of these three pictures. I want you to focus on the photo on uh, the kind of image on the left because that's the simplest kind. It pretty much just looks like a vase. And what sponges do is they have all of these pores on the sides of their bodies um, and they draw water in from, from the outside. They filter out things like food and nutrients and oxygen. And then that, the rest of the water, you know, all the stuff that they don't need gets kind of pushed into the middle of their body and then shot out through that top part called the osculum. And that's basically what sponges do. Um, the, the, regardless of kind of how complex their body becomes, that is their basic function. And if you see in these, in these images, all that red kind of on the inside of these sponges, what that represents are these little, almost like whip-like appendages. They're microscopic, so you're never going to see them, but these tiny little whips that are constantly beating. And it's that constantly beating whips that, that is pulling that water in from outside of the sponge so that it can get filtered by all of those independent cells they can take out what they need, and all the rest comes out through um, that osculum. 
So to try to demonstrate what that looks like, I'm going to attempt to show a video. Um, and I think uh, also a link to these videos is going to be dropped in the chat. But let's see how this goes. All right, so you are hopefully starting to see a video related to sponges. Basically, what's happening is these researchers are going to be putting a dye around the outside of the sponge. It's a fluorescent dye. It's very inert. It doesn't harm anything. It just kind of dissipates in a couple of minutes. But what this is going to be showing is how the, the sponge is able to pull water through its body, filter out what it needs, and then shoot the rest of the water out. So if you can see that fluorescent dye starting to get pulled through the inside of this sponge, and what it's doing right now, as I mentioned, is filtering out things like nutrients and food and oxygen. Nice close-up of a diver. <laughs> and you'll see they'll show a couple of different examples of sponges here. Um, but the same basic principle, the same principle, basic principle is true with all of these sponges. This is going to be closely related to one of the sponges that I'll show you today. But here's another example, and I really like this one because the osculum is quite small, and so you can really see how this dye gets shot out through this. Now, if you put your hand kind of over this osculum, you probably won't really be able to feel the water around it. And so I really like this visual example because it can show people that these guys aren't just sitting there. They're actively, you know, pulling in the water around them constantly, filtering the water. It's also one of the reasons that we really love to have sponges on our reefs because they're almost like cleaning the water constantly. So especially in places like South Florida, where we are dumping a whole lot of pollution, a whole lot of nutrients out into the water, what these sponges are doing are essentially cleaning the water for us. They're taking all those excess nutrients. Sometimes they're even taking those pollutants out of the water. So the more healthy sponges we have, hopefully the cleaner um, our water will be and the cleaner our ecosystem will be. All right, and if that didn't work for you, um, hopefully the link will be shared in the chat and you guys can kind of watch that on your own. I think it's super cool. And so we're going to start with one of my absolute favorite animals out on the reef, which is the giant barrel sponge, or the Zestospongia vita. Now, these guys are really living up to their name. Uh, they tend to be huge. Some people even call them the redwoods of the reef because they grow really, really large. They also tend to be quite red. So their coloration is pretty consistently this kind of reddish, brownish color. And on the inside, it can be a bit of a deeper purple. All around their body, they tend to have these kind of like bulbous knobs all over them. Um, sometimes, uh, so you can see them like really knobby in that photo on the left. On the right, they kind of look a little bit more knife-like or a little bit sharper. They're never truly sharp. These are really brittle animals. They'll never hurt you. But um, you can always tell them, you know, because of their color, this basic shape. Remember, it's like that basic um, sponge vase shape. Um, and this bulbous area all around them. Now, one of the really cool things about these guys is that the color that they have is actually due to a symbiotic algae that lives in their tissue. And so you're going to, or sorry, their cells, because they don't have tissue. But you're going to kind of hear that a few times throughout the presentation today. What this basically means is that the animal and the algae have an agreement with each other, where the sponge is offering a safe haven for this algae, somewhere safe that it can live. In exchange, the algae is going to sit there and all day it's going to photosynthesize. So it's going to take that light energy and convert it into things like sugars. And then it's going to share that back with the sponge. So the trade-off there is that the, the sponge offers protection and the algae offers like energy and food for, for the sponge. And so in that photo on the left, you see how there are those white patches? So those are actually areas where the algae is not. And so that's probably more like the true color of the sponge. It's that bright white area. And likely what's happening is the algae, either maybe there's something, some reason that that relationship is breaking down. Maybe the algae can't really get enough sunlight, so it kind of hides away from that area. But um, next time that you go out there and you see one of these giant barrel sponges, if you see those spots of white, you can think, ah, oh, that's an area where that symbiotic algae is not living in the sponge. And when we say that these guys are giant barrel sponges, we really mean that they're giant barrel sponges. These guys can grow to be many feet tall, and the osculum at the top can be large enough to fit a couple of people. Now, please never go inside of these sponges, but you, know, you can appreciate how large they are and think that you can fit inside it. One of the other things that we really love about these guys is that they are really awesome habitat. So one of the things, one of the reasons that coral reefs are these mega cities is because there's so much complexity there. 
there's so much three-dimensionality to the roof. And so having these large three-dimensional giant vases out there provides a lot of habitat for different kind of animals. So some of them will live kind of right inside. So you see like those crabs and that first fish are just hanging out, you know, in the middle of the sponge. But I would also challenge you guys, if you're at a site where you see a lot of these giant barrel sponges, take a look on the outside of the sponge where they have that bulbous area. Um, because you tend to find a lot of little things like shrimpies and crabbies that like to live in that place. So hopefully next time that you see one of these giant barrel sponges, you don't just think, oh, it's a sponge, but maybe you can go there and check it out and see if you can find any of the little animals that like to live in and around those sponges. Oh, this next sponge is awesome. I think it has a terrible name, the red boring sponge, uh, the Cleona delatrix. But the reason that it's called the red boring sponge is because this sponge is actually able to bore down into limestone and rock. So it, what it can do is it creates this corrosive material, and that corrosive material is actually able to break down that hard substrate underneath so that this sponge can really start to kind of like grow down in there, get a foothold, um, and, you know, pretty much bore down into these, into these structures. And it can, it's a lot of the natural root that they do this in, but you can also sometimes find them on like seawalls. Um, in terms of what they actually look like, so up close they tend to have um, kind of all of these similar like little bulbous things on them. Oftentimes people wonder if these are polyps, but they're not. Um, and the reason I bring that up is because some of the animals that we'll talk about later do have true polyps. So you can tell that these are not polyps because there's no opening in them, there's no tentacles there. They really just look like these little bulbous things all over. Um, these Cleona also have a lot of these different osculums all over. And when you look inside of them, they tend to have that like network or like cave-like, you know, picture like on the left it almost sometimes looks like um like a spider web in there and they tend to be this really vivid red or orange color and what's particularly cool about these red boring sponges is that oftentimes they fight coral for space so in all these photos what you're seeing is a cleona essentially overtaking these corals now we don't really know why I would venture a guess that they kind of know that corals are growing in places that like have good light and good water circulation. And so they think, well, if a coral can grow here, you know, this is where I want to live. So what they do is they find a little place to have, you know, to, to take a foothold. It's usually at like the edge of a colony or maybe a little part of the dead colony. And they, they take a foothold there. And then they use that same corrosive material that they use to bore down into the rocks to actually wage chemical warfare against these corals usually killing the coral and then taking over that colony or that skeleton that it had just built. So you can see that I think especially in that middle photo where you see that kind of like white edge all around the coral. So that's the active place where these two animals are waging a kind of warfare against each other. And in some very admittedly rare cases, you can sometimes see that coral fighting back. So corals will sometimes use their like digestive filaments they are essentially like turning their digestive system inside out and trying to eat that sponge back. Now, they almost never win this, but I still think it's exciting if you're out on the reef and you see one of these corals kind of fighting with the sponge, you'll know, oh, this isn't just some, you know, two things living happily next to each other. You should know this is like active warfare going on. They're like really fighting each other for this space and this real estate. Okay, and the last sponge that I have for you today is the red poor rope sponge. Um, so this is this um, kind of sponge. It always has this kind of light pink coloration and tends to grow in this almost like tangled masses like you see here. Um, they tend to live on kind of uh, either things like sea, like, like walls on reefs or steep slopes, actually in very similar places to where you might find um, those giant barrel sponges. Because those giant barrel sponges also like to be in places, um, especially places like, like reef slopes. I think the reason is that they get a lot of really good water circulation out there. And both of these sponges tend to be pretty hardy. So they're able to deal with like strong currents, they can deal with, with things that are like swinging by in the, in the water. Um, so they like to be in those kind of areas. Um, again, with these rope sponges, uh, just like those giant barrel sponges, is they tend to be really good habitat. So I would, I would say if you find, especially some of these larger rope sponges out there, if you can go and take a peek around them, oftentimes you can find things like little shrimp and little crabs, and sometimes even little fish that like to live in these tangled masses. They really like to kind of hide and use this as protection. Um, as you can see, they have like really, really small osculums on it. So all of those little dots that you see on that photo on the right, that's the area where the sponge is, you know, excluding that water that they filtered back out. 
Um, and I think that's why it's called the red pore rope sponge is because those kind of look like pores. One of the other reasons that I like to include this in this presentation um, is because this is an animal that we like, not just for the sake of it being an animal, but also for what it can give humans. So biomedical researchers found out that this kind of rope sponge has something in its body that helps fight HIV or the virus that causes AIDS. And so that's really cool for us to consider that right outside you know, uh, of our backyard, kind of right out there in the ocean, we have what's almost like a pharmacy out there waiting for us to discover this you know, new generation of treatments for diseases that are really ailing us humans. And I think this one is particularly potent in South Florida because we have one of the highest rates of HIV AIDS in the entire country. And to think that we have this organism literally right off of our coast, I mean, within swimming distance of the coast that can help you know, so many of our, of our ailing compatriots down here, um, I just get really happy every time I see you know, like a happy, healthy rope sponge out there. So that's all I've got for you for sponges today. Um, I think we can take a quick break for any questions that we have, but again, I hope that you, know, you guys can all learn to love sponges as much as I do. Very cool, Maurizio. I don't see any questions in the box yet, but you guys just go ahead and type them into the question box or even in the chat box, and we're happy to get those answered for you. Hey, Mary Lou. I, I see a couple, um, a couple comments from Layla Brown that um, when you were talking about the diversity of invertebrates, she said things like the sea is like New York City, and wow, that is really cool. Um, we had a question in also from Jeff. I know this is focused on the reef in system, but would you by any chance have any resources for studying? Um, these animals in mangrove and seagrass estuaries. I run tours there and there are so many beautiful specimens that live on prop roots and seagrass meadows. Thanks. That is so true. Um, so I specialize in coral reefs and so I don't personally know much about those animals, but in our network of you know friends and collaborators, I'm sure that we can find someone to connect you to. Um, I do know that I have a colleague at um, in Florida Sea Grant who's working on like sponge restoration and sponge aquaculture and so I'm happy to reach out to her and see if she has any um, kind of additional information on sponges that you find in these other ecosystems. Absolutely. Um, Jesse Friedland, uh, sorry if I butchered that, um, asks what is your favorite sponge? <laughs> That is an excellent question, Jesse. I have to admit, it is the giant barrel sponge. There's just something about seeing these like enormous sponges out on the reefs that is so much fun, um, especially in some areas like when you get to reef slopes where you can just find them just totally covered in these in these giant sponges. Um, I often find that when I'm diving with people, they are like completely ignoring the sponges to go look at I don't know like fish and other boring things like that. And so it's almost like I get those giant barrel sponges to myself. So I can kind of like scoot around them. I can find my favorite little shrimpies in there. Um, the, the photo that I showed before, I'm gonna go back here, um, has these little barber pole shrimp in them. Um, so these guys over here, I love being able to find them because they have these really long whiskers on them. And so sometimes you don't even like notice the shrimp itself. You just, it just looks like the sponge has the whiskers. Um, and I just think it's always exciting to be able to find these guys uh, hiding on those sponges. Cool. There's quite a few questions coming in. Maurizio, how many do you have time to answer, do you think? Well, I will say I have never been able to keep this presentation to an hour, so let's do another two. <laughs> okay, we'll do two, and then maybe if we have more time, we'll catch some of those other questions at the end. Let's see. Um, do, do, do. Oh, gosh, there are so many. Um, Let's see. Um, we have a question. How does the red pore sponge take in water? Does it take in water and push it out the same place? I was a little confused. For sure. Um, that's a great question. So yes, they do. Um, so if I'll go back to this. So you can think of it, it's almost um, like this, where you see how complicated it is, where 
the water can kind of go in through all of these different places and then come out through just a few of these, these osculums. So when you look at this uh, red flowing sponge, essentially what it's doing is it's able to draw in water from all of this red area. So all of this area is actively pulling water in from the surrounding environment, and then it's getting pushed back out through these large holes. So it's the same principle as that giant barrel sponge, it's just kind of like flattened. Interesting. Um, and then one more question. There are a couple that I think I might be able to answer independently in the chat, so I'll try my best. Um, is what we see in stores as a loofah a type of sponge? Uh, it definitely depends on what kind. People do use uh, sea sponges as loofahs. Um, I have done the same. They feel very, very nice. Um, for the most part, those are aquacultured, so they're grown specifically for that purpose. Um, but yes, they are they are sponges. They're sea sponges. All right, thanks. Um, so thanks, Shelby. I guess uh, you can tackle some of the questions in there, and I will move us on to one of my absolute favorite groups of animals, the cnidarians. So the cnidarians are a pretty diverse group of animals, and I'll actually be spending a fair bit of time on this, but remember how I mentioned that all of these animals are connected by a single feature? So I just wanna ask the group, can you guess what connects all of these different animals? What connects a jellyfish to a coral, to a zoanthid, to a sea fan? Um, and you can go ahead and drop your questions in the chat, uh, sorry, to uh, drop your, your guesses down in the chat. All right, I'm seeing, I'm seeing some good guesses in here. I'm seeing polyps and tentacles and stingers. Great, great guesses. And so the true thing that is holding all of these guys together is in fact that they are stinging creatures. So these guys have a set of very specialized stinging cells called nidocytes. Um, and what these nidocytes are, are essentially like spring-loaded, envenomated harpoons. They are microscopic, and so that image that you see on the right was actually taken with an electron microscope. So you cannot see these with the naked eye, but boy, can you feel them sometimes. The basic idea behind these is that um, you see all those like hair-like things in that photo, or you can see them as the quote trigger over here. Um, this is like the physical trigger for these to get to, to shoot off. So anytime something you know physically touches one of these triggers, they open their lid and out goes that spring-loaded harpoon that's filled with venom. And one of the reasons that I like to kind of emphasize this point is not just because it's important to kind of know what unifies all these creatures, but also to remind you as, as we're talking about these that, you know, the best way to not get harmed by these guys is just to not touch them. They're never gonna shoot these at you because they want to, you know, because they see you somewhere. It's always gonna be as if you come in direct contact with them. But yeah, great job, everyone. It's the stingers, stingers that are holding these guys together. So we're gonna cover four basic groups of cnidarians today. I'll talk very, very briefly about the cubozoans, or the box jellies. Then we'll talk about some of the absolutely stunning cyphozoans, or your true jellies. And I do wanna emphasize that I'm saying jellies on purpose. Um, oftentimes these are called jellyfish, but they are not even remotely close to fish. Next, we're going to talk about the anthozoans, which includes things like corals and anemones. And then we'll wrap up with your hydrozoans, which includes things like fire coral um, and your Portuguese man of war. So starting with the box jellies, I'm not even going to show you any more pictures of these guys because you normally do not find them out on coral reefs. And in fact, there are only, I think, something like four species that are found in the Caribbean, only one of which I know has been reported in Florida. And it's only really found in the mangrove systems up in Boca Raton. So you're really never going to encounter these guys out on the reef, but they get a lot of press because despite being really, really teeny tiny, so that one, that, that image that you see there, probably that dome at the top is maybe the size of your fingernail, um, they are incredibly venomous to the point that there are some Pacific species that have been known to kill humans. But please let me emphasize, none of the species that are found in the Caribbean have been known to kill anybody. 
They do uh, hurt like hell if you touch them, but pretty much in Florida, unless you're swimming in the mangrove systems in Boca Raton, you probably don't have to worry about these guys. The cytosones, on the other hand, are your true jellies, and we do find them um, out on Florida's coral reefs. So cytosones, they, they don't really have any durable parts. No part of them is hard. They really are true to that jelly name. They don't have a skeleton. They don't have any specialized organs for things like respiration um, or excretion. And the marine jellyfish, these cytosones, they can be like 98% water. They're very goopy. What they do have that's pretty cool though, is they have a ring of muscle fibers around the ring of their dome. And they use that to do that kind of undulation movement um, that we think of as swimming. So they just contract and decontract <laughs> um, those muscle fibers and that's how they make that really cool undulation. What's important to note though is that these guys are actually considered plankton. And the reason is because they're not really swimming. They're not able to swim against any current. They are very much at the whim of how the water moves. And that's how we define plankton. Um, most of the true jellies that we have, most of these cysozoans, they are what we call gonochoric, which means that they have separate males and females of their species. However, in addition to the kind of sexual reproduction that they would do, many of these species can also reproduce asexually, essentially by butting off a little piece of them to create a tiny little clone. Now the first cyphozoan that we have today are the moon jellies. And these guys are probably my favorite of the jellies. Um, they are very, very common. And so odds are, if you see a jelly, it's gonna be one of these moon jellies. Um, they're definitely most common from like April-ish to November-ish, kind of depending on what the temperatures have been like and what the water currents are like. Um, the, the, one of the reasons I really like seeing these guys is because they're a very important food source for things like mahi-mahi and turtles. The mahi-mahi are a fish that people love to fish and also to eat, and sea turtles, of course, absolutely everyone loves. So it's a good thing if you're seeing um, some of the moon jellies out there because you know that these other animals that we really like have their food source out there. However, if you happen to see an absolute ton of moon jellies, that might actually be a sign that things are not going so well. The reason being is that if they don't have any predators to eat them, their populations can really explode. So if you're out there seeing a ton of these, you might think, well, maybe our mahi-mahi are being overfished or maybe our turtles are not doing so well. Um, but the basic name of these moon jellies is because I guess their dome kind of looks like a moon. <laughs> and many times you will find them in this really beautiful, like translucent white color, um, sometimes they're like a translucent pink or purple. I truly love them when they're that pink or purple color. They're just, they're absolutely stunning. Um, they have kind of underneath, if you can see, I think you can see my mouse, if you can see these kind of like frilly bits under here, um, there are four of these so-called oral arms, and that's what they use to eat. So if you see all around the edge, these are their tentacles. This is the area where they have all of those nidocytes getting ready to sting things. They are super, super short. And so unless you like really barrel into one of these jellies, they're not gonna sting you. But they're able to still catch prey that way. And when they catch something in their nidocytes, they're able to move it on inward using that muscle contraction um, to kind of give over to this oral arm where it can actually perform digestion. Now, one of the really notable features about these stunning moon jellies is this kind of horseshoe shaped or clover shaped um, little bit at the top. Uh, in the chat, can anyone guess what this is? What do you what do you think this clover shape does? <laughs> it does indeed provide good luck. <laughs> Um, so in fact, there's a, there's a correct answer in there. So it, these are the gonads. This is what these um, animals, this is where they keep things like their eggs and their sperm. So remember how I mentioned that some of these um, species have males and females, moon jellies are one of those. So some of these will contain eggs and some of them will contain sperm. And when it's time to spawn, they will all gather together and they will release their eggs and their sperm in this large spawning event to make new moon jellies. 
Um, and so these are definitely most notable toward the end of summer, so usually around like August and September, because that's right before they tend to do their spawning, so they can be like really deep purple like you see in this photo. Anyway, I love moon jellies. Okay, and the next jelly that I have for you is the always adorable upside down jelly or the Cassiopeia frondosa. Now these guys are usually not found on the reef reef, but instead they're found in like sandy areas um, or like back reef areas or lagoons. Oftentimes you can find them in kind of what people would consider gross places like in um, near like boat ramps or, or marinas or things like that. You can find these guys super happy and healthy, like thriving in those areas. Most often they're, they are found resting on the bottom. So if you imagine how the moon jelly, it has this um, kind of dome at the top and then the tentacles on the bottom. Well, the upside down jellyfish is, as the name suggests, upside down. So that dome kind of sits on the bottom and they extend their tentacles upwards. But remember how I talked about that sponge having a symbiotic algae? Well, so too does this upside down jellyfish. So all of this brown coloration that you see, especially in that photo on the right, that is that algae that's sitting there and photosynthesizing. And similar to that sponge, they have that trade-off where this upside down jellyfish is you know, giving the, the algae it's a safe place to live, it's protecting it from predators, um, and in exchange it's getting that, um, it's essentially getting the, the byproducts of photosynthesis. Um, these jellies, you know, like the others, they do have the nidocytes in there, and if you touch them, it'll give you like a little bit of a sting, like maybe a little bit of a rash. Um, I've only ever gotten itchy from feeling them, but as always, try not to, you know, touch them. Um, they're really fun to see, though, because when they sit on the bottom, they still do that undulation motion. So it almost looks like they're constantly just trying to, like, swim down into the sand and just unable to do to do so. And it's just kind of, like, funny to think of their whole life spending just, like, trying to swim downwards, but they just can't. They just can't make it. <laughs> um, but they are, of course, able to swim. And so if ever they want to move into a new place or they get disrupted, like maybe someone didn't lift their motor high enough and, you know, the propeller spun up a lot of things, then these are actually able to kind of swim, find a new place to settle, go down happy and healthy and live on their life as they do. Um, many times you will see people, you know, want to play around with these and still kind of like bat them up into the water. And I assume that's what happened in some of these photos. And I have to say, I don't encourage folks to do that with any animals. It's probably not the worst thing, you know, to happen to these, but I would still say try to enjoy them as they are, just sitting, you know, happy doing their little kind of undulation on the bottom. So that's all I have for the Cyphozoans. I think those two um, are the ones that you're most likely to see, and they're also, in my opinion, very charismatic. And next up, we have the very large and diverse group of Anthozoans. Um, I am not going to be able to talk about all of these, and I especially can't talk about some of my favorites. But I would be remiss if I didn't at least say that the hard corals that we have out on coral reefs um, are anthozoans. So remember how I mentioned that coral reefs are kind of like megacities? Well, these hard corals are like the building. They are really what allows everything else to live on coral reefs. They are the things that are building the primary three-dimensional structure that ends up being that habitat for so, so many different creatures. And what these images are meant to show is that corals, kind of like those sponges, grow in so, so many different ways. And that's so important because it means that it creates so many different kinds of habitat that allows so many of those very diverse creatures to live here. So you have some that grow into these massive like boulder-like or even mountain-like structures, some that have those like fronds, some that grow into pillars, some that have these cool you know, designs on them. But you really need that diversity of coral out there to support the diversity of animals. And so maybe if you think of buildings in a city, you know, someone mentioned New York. Well, in New York, you have those really tall skyscrapers, but you also have, you know, those brownstones. And you have little townhouses in some places and you have shorter ap apartment buildings. Now, if you only had one kind of apartment building in a city, you would kind of just attract the same kind of person. But it's a city like that that has so many different kinds of places to live that it attracts so many different kinds of people. And that is the same thing that is true with these coral reefs. It's also important, as I may have mentioned, these corals, they, they actually build the reef. So as they grow through time, they're actually creating a skeleton underneath their tissue. And what that does is through time continues to build up on top of each other to kind of keep building that three-dimensional structure. 
And so if you lose these corals, you also tend to lose those structures because they tend to biodegrade, they tend to get broken down by other things. And so that's why it's important not just to have had coral, but to continue to have coral to keep these ecosystems alive and healthy and happy. Another animal, oh, and I should also mention, if you want to know more about corals, uh, one, of the, one of the courses later this month um, is about stony coral identification, and I highly encourage you to join that because corals are just like the coolest animals. Um, also kind of like the coolest animals are sea fans. Uh, so these are a group called the Gorgonians. Um, these are one of many different kinds of soft corals that we have. And so these are distinct from hard corals, as the name suggests, in that they don't build that skeleton. So they don't put down that calcium carbonate skeleton that builds the reef. But these animals are still really important to doing things like creating that three-dimensional structure, adding complexity to the reef so that lots of different creatures can enjoy them. And so I like to in include pictures of these Gorgonians because, number one, they are stunningly beautiful, um, especially when you can find these like very vividly pink and purple um, types. They are just so beautiful to look at. Oftentimes they're in very shallow water because they also um, you know, they like those kind of habitats. And so you can oftentimes see them just by snorkeling. Um, they tend to, you know, like wave back and forth with the ocean. They're just like, it can be like so meditative just to hang out with these guys and float back and forth in the water with them. Um, and just like some of those other animals that I talked about, these are really cool because a lot of little critters like to live on them. So many times you can take a look, a close look at these Gorgonians and find things like small shrimp and small crabs and small snails and stuff like that that like to live all around these guys. Um, so definitely keep an eye out for sea fans. Um, now, I also want to talk about the white encrusting zoanthid, which is uh, a palisoa species. The reason that I bring this up is because um, corals are not necessarily um, as abundant, or they're definitely not as abundant as they used to be. Um, so we've kind of thrown a lot of uh, stressors at these, uh, at these corals, and they haven't been faring all that terribly well. And in their place, these palisoa have really started to shine. Um, What's important to note is while these are related to corals and that they're also in cnidarian, so they have these kind of more hidden stinging cells inside them, um, they don't create that same kind of skeleton. Instead, what they do is they just encrust over usually things like dead coral skeleton. But many times if you go out and you see something that looks like this that you might think is a coral, take a look and wonder if it's actually a zoanthid. So you can tell these palethoa species because those little polyps that they have they're, they're much more cavernous. They're, they very much look like an opening, as opposed to coral polyps that look like it's kind of filled with tissue and has very clear tentacles usually coming out of them. So corals have that veneer of tissue. It's like this very thin veneer of um, almost like translucent gook all around it. Um, they also tend to have like mucus all over them, whereas these, these zoanthids don't really have that same um, translucent quality to them. They don't really have that mucus around them. And you definitely really can't see the tentacles uh, because they don't really have them. Um, but it's important to know because you probably are going to start seeing these more and more, especially now that you know what you're looking for. Um, one of the things that I want to mention about these zoanthids as well, in case there's anyone who does any sort of um, aquarium stuff, uh, these guys do produce a toxin. It's called a palytoxin. Um, and uh, it's not going to harm humans. It's definitely not going to hurt you when you're just swimming by them on the reef. But if you introduce them into an aquarium, um, they do have the potential to kill other organism, organisms that you have in there. So definitely be careful. Um, yeah, I think that's all I got on those wanted, but keep an eye out for these polyphyla. Uh, moving on is the absolutely stunning giant anemone. Um, so these guys are very closely related to those hard corals. But just like the zoanthids and just like the soft corals, these guys do not build any sort of skeleton. Um, these giant anemones are normally found in like crevices in rocks um, or, you know, reef structure, things like seawalls. But they really like uh, areas of high, you know, high water movement. The reason being is that these guys are pretty active hunters. So you see those really stunning like lavender tips or purple tips that they have. That's where they have those collections of stinging cells. And what they do is they like to sit in these areas where there's a lot of fast water movement and catch anything that's swimming on by. And so in addition to catching things like little, like, uh, you know, like uh, buggy things like zooplankton that are swimming around, even little things like shrimp and crabs, we've even seen them eat fish. 
So they're kind of sitting there trying to grab anything that they can out of this really fast water movement. Um, what's also really cool about them, though, is that they can move from their crevices. So these guys are pretty active. What they'll do is if they're sitting somewhere for a while and they're not really catching anything, they will plop themselves outside of their little rock crevice and start to move around on the reef to try to find a better place to do their hunting. And so what that means is that sometimes you can actually sit around and watch this little guy like scoot along trying to find a new place for you know, to be its hunting ground. And what's super awesome is that it seems that some of these guys actually will try to find um, like areas where other giant anemones have been doing very well so that they can fight them off and take their rock credit. So they'll go there and use their stinging cells on each other to have these little like anemone turf wars so that one can now take over this like prime hunting spot. So these guys are absolutely awesome and I love seeing them. They can be pretty large as well, not, not nearly as big as your giant sponges. Um, I've definitely seen them, like if you open your hand, I've seen one that's like that big. The tentacles probably get to be, I don't know, like six or seven inches long. I don't know how many centimeters that is. <laughs> I know we have some Canadians on the line. <laughs> um, but they're super cool. They're very big and I love seeing them. They're really good at waving around. And kind of similar to those sea fans, sometimes you can be pretty meditative just to watch them kind of float around. Less meditative though, once you see them actually catch something and start to eat, it's like, it can be a little bit brutal. All right, the second anemone that I have for you is the corkscrew anemone. Um, I kind of feel like I've grown much more affectionate to this anemone during quarantine because sometimes I wake up and I feel like I look like a corkscrew anemone with my crazy quarantine hair. Um, but these guys, as the name suggests, um, are really distinctive because of that cork corkscrew-like or kind of like spirally um, tentacles that they have. So these guys can have like 200 separate tentacles on a single tiny little guy. I mean, the base that you see near the bottom is, you know, uh, I don't know, larger than a quarter, definitely, but not terribly huge. And they can still have 200 distinct tentacles coming off of the top. Now, just like some of the other animals that we talked about before, these guys can photosynthesize. So they have another symbiotic algae that lives inside their tissues, but these are also pretty active hunters. And so they don't generate nearly as much energy from photosynthesis as things like that upside down jellyfish or um, the sponges or even the corals. Um, so, so these guys really do like to hunt. What I really love about these guys as well is in addition to sexual reproduction, so they do that same thing where they develop you know, sperms and eggs and they have these spawning things. Um, what they can also do is something called petal laceration, where if you see this image on the left, essentially what they'll do is they'll take one of these stripes and just start cutting themselves down the middle. And they will just bisect their body in two, split into two separate anemones, and keep growing as two individuals that are genetically identical. And the reason I like to bring that up is because sometimes you will find like a pretty high concentration of these corkscrew anemones all hanging out together. And so now you can know if you see that, you can think to yourself, well, are these guys two separate anemones? Or maybe is this an anemone that decided to start splitting itself off, cloning itself, you know, and create a bunch of its own little like twins around it that almost have this little like posse of corkscrew enemies hanging out together. Now, oftentimes you're not actually going to see that base, that part of it, that pedal, you know, that lower part of it. All that you're going to see is that crazy, you know, corkscrew top of it spilling out of little crevices. So these guys don't like that high energy, um, you know, any high energy places like the giant enemies do. These guys you'll find kind of much lower to the ground usually in, in you know, areas that are a little bit calmer. So they don't really rely on things kind of swimming by. What I think they do is they try to almost look like algae or just try to be generally translucent so that something will like accidentally bump into them. And then when something accidentally bumps into them, they'll be able to snag it using their tentacles, using those stinging cells. They'll be able to either, you know, like paralyze or just grab onto those animals, bring it in towards its, um, you know, its mouth that's right in the middle and then munch away at it. So I would say definitely keep an eye out for these guys. I think it's funny because I at first did not know what these were. I thought they, they were a worm or like a, a series of worms together. And so I was really excited to find out actually it's an anemone and actually it can see you. <laughs> oh, and I'm so sorry to say goodbye to the anthozoans, but we also have the really cool hydrozoans. The reason that I like to include the hydrozoans is because they're kind of a confusing group where they seem very similar to the Stiphozoans and the Anthozoans, um, but they're not. So the two that I'll talk about are shown here, the um, Fire Coral and the Portuguese Man-of-War. 
So starting with the fire coral, this is a genus of hydrozoan um, that I think has a little bit of a misleading name because it's not a true coral. So while it does build um, a skeleton, it's not the same kind of a skeleton that those hard corals build. So this is not a reef building coral in any way. The skeleton is very brittle. It breaks apart really easily. And especially once the fire coral dies, uh, it kind of just like dissipates into nothing. And so it's doing nothing to really build that reef framework. Um, the reason it's called fire coral, though, is because it has a pretty nasty sting. Um, so I would definitely say if you, you know, like all of these things, try not to touch them. But if you've accidentally bumped into something and you start to feel a pretty bad burning sensation, you maybe accidentally bumped into one of these fire corals. Now, I also want to uh, kind of direct your attention to that uh, genus name, Millipora. The reason that it's called Millipora, that in, I think, Latin means like a thousand pores. And that's the reason is because the polyps of this animal are really teeny tiny. And so a single colony of this fire coral is going to be covered in just thousands and thousands of these tiny little um, polyps. And extending from those polyps are the tentacles. That's what includes those nidocytes and the, you know, envenomated harpoons that are going to give you that really bad burning sensation. Um, but I think it's really cool. It's, it's, a, it's another way that you can distinguish these guys if you're um, trying to look at them and try to figure out if they're a, you know, true hard coral or a fire coral. If you cannot really make out the polyps, then they're a fire coral. And if they're this really, really fine fuzziness, they are probably also a fire coral. And the last of the cnidarians that you have is, in my opinion, maybe the most beautiful animal in the ocean. It is the Portuguese man o' war. Um, so this is uh, this group is called it's called siphonophore. Um, I maybe you guys have seen these guys on the beach. Um, oftentimes that's where we see them. But what's what's really cool about these Portuguese man o' war is that unlike your jellies, so when you think about the jelly, you can think of that as a single polyp. So it's a single, you know, dome with its tentacle. That's just one unit. It's one polyp. This Portuguese man of war is actually an animal that's made up of four distinct polyps. Now we'll go into in the next slide specifically what those polyps are. But I'm just stalling a little bit on this page because I want you to appreciate just how beautiful these animals are. <sighs> okay, so the four polyps that you have with these Portuguese man of war. Um, I've included their scientific names in here, not because I want you to remember them, but just because I think they're really cool. <laughs> so that the first polyp that you have is this gas-filled sac at the top, and that's called a nematophore. And if you want to remember it, um, you think of nemata like, um, like a pneumatic device or a pneumatic drill, something like that. It essentially means like something that's powered by air or air pressure. And the reason, like you can see in this photo on the left, is because this gas-filled sac is what they use for locomotion. This is essentially their sail, and part of the reason why they're named that Portuguese man of war. So unlike the jellies that have that, um, that bit of um, um, muscle that they can contract to actually do that undulation, these guys do not have that muscle, and they don't do any sort of locomotion on their own. They just rely on the wind to push them through life, kind of leaving their tentacles at the bottom to do that hunting for different animals. And that's actually why you will oftentimes see these guys on the beach is because they have no way of not getting there. Pretty much if the wind takes them to the beach, the wind takes them to the beach and they la vie. So that's the first polyp that you have, that nematophore, that gas-filled sac. Then that kind of mess of stuff right underneath the, the nematophore, that's two different polyps that's really hard to distinguish visually. Um, it's your gastrozoid and your gonodendron. Essentially, this is the polyp, the gastrozoid is the polyp that does digestion. So anything that it catches, it gets moved up to that gastrozoid, and that's where they actually digest the thing that they're eating. Then that gonodendron is where they do reproduction. So just like a lot of species we talked about, they can develop their eggs or their sperm in this specific polyp, and then they'll release it when they want to spawn. And the last little bit, this last thing that's still considered a polyp, is the tentacular papillon, which you can just remember as the sting bits. Um, but I think it's really cool to think of these guys as it's almost these four independent units that have figured out a way to all kind of work together in this really awesome, beautiful creature. Um, I'm going to go back a slide also just to point out that these guys can have very, very long tentacles. Um, I've heard reports of these tentacles being like 10 feet long. I've never seen one even nearly that long, but just 
a word of caution because these guys have a very nasty sting. Um, I've been stung by them one time and it was really, really unpleasant. Um, and I like to bring this up also because they're so beautiful and they kind of look like fun things to play with. Oftentimes kids want to go and grab them. So if you've got little kiddos on the beach and you notice them, uh, you know, as Man of War is about, you don't necessarily have to be nervous around them, but definitely tell your children you know, to be careful around them. Um, if you do choose to handle them when I really don't think you should, you can pick them up by the, the top of their sack and you won't get hurt. And I mentioned that in, not, be, not if you want to play with it, but really if you want to move it somewhere, you know, get it out of harm's way. Otherwise, you can kind of cover them with sand, um, especially that tentacle part. It's not foolproof, but the idea, if you remember that these are physically, you know, triggered uh, tentacles, they're tr you need to touch them in order for them to fire off. So if you cover them in sand, you might be kind of getting those ten the, the um, nidocytes to shoot off and then you won't get hurt by them. Um, so just a couple things. If you want to move them, grab them by the top, I'll cover them in sand. Um, but otherwise, just appreciate them for how stunningly beautiful they are. Also, shout out, it's not, a, um, it's not a Caribbean species, but you can also look up, there's a certain kind of sea slug that feeds on these Portuguese men of war, and they are similarly just absolutely stunning. And I don't know how like two of the most beautiful animals on earth decided that they wanted to like do things together. I mean, one is eating the other, but still, uh, they're just both so beautiful. I don't like to look them up. Anyway, so those are your Portuguese man of wars, and those are your Nidarians. This is probably my favorite group of marine um, invertebrates, and so I can pause there and ask any questions or just continue to gush about any of these animals if you want. I'm actually just going to go back to this slide so we can look at them. All right. Thank you, Maurizio. Um, we have a question from Layla. Can you see anemones on crabs? Yeah, so you can actually. Um, there are certain crabs that do something. They, they essentially like decorate themselves. So what they're, they'll do is they'll find things to either um, make themselves uh, kind of blend in with their surroundings or in the cases of where they put anemones on top of them, probably for protection because they know that they got those stingers on. So they kind of just like plop an anemone on top of them. And it's almost like, you know, you know, like Medusa, you know how she had that snake head. It's kind of that similar vibe of they're just trying to put something that can sting um, other things to keep predators away. So those are very cool crabs. We just generally call them like decorator crabs, but there are a few different species that we have in the Caribbean. Cool. Um, from John Eastman, fire coral seems to be parasitic, taking over other animals. Is there anything that keeps it from spreading or in balance? I've seen hard bottoms totally taken over by fire coral. Yeah, for sure. Um, so I wouldn't necessarily call them parasitic. So parasitic applies that it's like um, it's an animal that's uh, kind of feeding off another one. So we're, we're going to get into worms in a bit, and I <laughs> realize I'm way over time already. <laughs> we'll, we'll talk about true parasites there. What I think is happening with fire corals is as we've lost a lot of hard corals, things are taking up their space. So one of the things about coral reefs, remember I mentioned that they're mega cities? Just like in a city where there's any like little area of land, people love to develop there, right? They love to build new buildings and things like that. If ever a building falls, almost immediately a new building is going to go up in its place. And I think it's that same principle with things like fire coral or zoanthids. So as we lose that hard coral, those other animals are moving in and taking over that space. They no longer have these other animals that can fight them for that kind of hard bottom area. Cool. Um, we have one from Derry, which I think you might have answered, but um, I'll go ahead and ask it again. When beached, will Portuguese man of war still sting you? How long can they survive out of water? Yeah, so normally when you see them on the beach, you can consider them dead. Um, I don't know how true that is, but I, I think it's a safe bet to say that they're dead. However, their stingers can continue to sting for something crazy like two weeks. Um, so again, because these, because they're not like consciously stinging, it's a physical trigger. What that means is that if you encounter them, even past when the animal itself is alive, if that trigger, if that cell is still there, it can still sting you. Um, and so definitely be careful with these guys because it's, it's like crazy how long their stingers can stay active, even when they're sitting out on the beach. Great question. And then I think, um, who else? Diana asked a question, thought kind of shots fired. Mauricio, are you team sponge or team coral? How could you make me choose? 
Uh, okay, I will admit I'm team coral all the way. I really, really, really love sponges. Um, I, you know, number one, I think, I don't know if it's because I'm Italian or what, but I, like, I, I think it's important to respect your elders. And so in that way, I think it's really important to respect sponges. They are like the oldest common relative that all of us animals have. So I have a huge, huge amount of respect for sponges there. But corals themselves, you know, they build out this massive ecosystem. They are really incredible creatures in and themselves. They have that symbiosis with, um, with algae, but they also do a lot of feeding. Um, uh, there's just so much that I absolutely adore about corals. So I will admit I am team coral. What about you guys? <laughs> I'm looking to see. There are some that um, were kind of from the previous, so I'm trying to find. No worries, and I apologize, folks, that I'm already over the hour. Um, we've just got two quick groups to go through, <laughs> and then the quiz. <laughs> okay. Um, James McNee, hi, Uncle Mo. How do jellyfish stings work? Does <laughs> help? I love you. <laughs> <laughs> I love you too, James. Um, sorry, you, you broke a little bit. What was the, what, can you repeat the question? How do jellyfish stings work, which I think you got into a little bit, and then does peeing on them help? Um, uh, well, I don't want to dissuade anyone from peeing on each other because I think it's really funny, but it's not going to do very much for, um, for the stingers. So in part, um, the idea behind, the idea behind introducing something acidic to them is because they think that the acid can help break down that venom um, that that the coral kind of injects when it's uh, sorry that the the jellyfish or sorry the jelly <laughs> injects once it stings you. The best thing that you can do when you get stung by a jelly is first to wash it off with seawater. Um, so if you can get a bunch of, of seawater and get it off you, because sometimes the tentacles will actually stick to you. So those mitocytes, in, a, in addition to, or to uh, in addition to, to, you know, putting venom inside you, they can also make the tentacle stick to you. So step one is to get that tentacle off of you so that no more mitocytes can sting you. Then you just want to wash the area off with some seawater because that will get, you know, any of like remaining of those barbs off of you and any kind of remaining other things off of you. In some cases, something very acidic like vinegar can help. And so oftentimes they will have vinegar in like um, those lifeguard posts. And so that can help, but it does not help on all. So I would say the best thing you can do, just wash it off with seawater um, and then kind of save, you know, save peeing on each other for, for other times. What? Um. Okay. <laughs> um, all right. Wait, was asked, um, and maybe we'll let this be the last one before moving on. I often see small, clear bobs, blobs, maybe half a cup in size, washed up on beaches. I've been told they are egg cases. Could they be jellies instead? <sighs> they could be the next group of jellies that we're talking about, though they can also be egg cases. So that's the perfect segue into the tenophores, or the comb jellies. Um, so the reason that these guys are distinct from the other jellies is because they do not have those stinging cells. Instead, these tenophores are called the comb bearers. And that's um, because they have these kind of comb-looking things all over the main part of their body. Um, so it's kind of difficult to see in pretty much any of these photos. <laughs> but on the edges of all of these tenophores, on all of these comb jellies, um, are these tiny little whip-like appendages called cilia. So think back all the way to those sponges. Remember how that red part of that little uh, diagram I mentioned is where they have these tiny little whips that are constantly beating that moves that water through? So these jellies have that same kind of thing, but they use it for locomotion. Um, so essentially the way that these guys move, they're, they're also considered plankton because they're not very strong swimmers, but they do have these, these little whip-like things that they have all along the body. That's kind of why they look almost like, I don't know, a little bit unclear on the sides maybe is because they have these tiny little things that are constantly beating that they use to move backwards and forwards through the water. Now, as I mentioned, they don't have any of these stinging cells and instead they have two main ways of feeding. Um, some like the one on the left, they have these really long two tentacles that they can extend behind them that have essentially a different kind of, you know, mechanism. It's not really a stinger so much as it is, is like a grabber. So they put these things out behind them with the hopes that little like zooplankton will swim into them 
and then get caught. Once they get caught, the tenophore is able to reel back in these two um, tentacles and they'll digest whatever they were able to catch. Other cases, like some of these that you don't see the tentacles, like A over here or S and E, what these guys do is they actually will swim around using those little, um, the little combs that they have, and they will actually envelop other animals and then eat them. Oftentimes, they're actually eating other jellies, including other tenophores. Um, and so these guys, I want to you know, stress again, they don't have any um, tentacles, I'm uh, sorry, any stingers. And so they're totally, they're not going to hurt you at all if you touch them. And so if you do see these kind of little blobs on the beach, don't worry about it. Um, um, so one of those super duper duper cool things about tenophores is that they can bioluminesce. What that means is that they can create their own light. And so there's one way in that they're truly creating their own light and another way that it's just a little bit um, misleading. So in that photo on the left, that's actually not true bioluminescent. What you see here is that area where you have all of those little um, cilia, all those things that are beating really fast. And what that constant motion of the beating does is it, is it kind of scatters the light and creates a rainbow under there. And so it's not that they're creating any light in this way, it's that they're really just scattering that light so you can see the rainbow. On the right picture, however, is a tenophore that is actually producing its own light. So very basically, um, uh, I'm kind of taking this a little bit back to you know basic biology, but maybe if you remember Schoolhouse Rock, how you have the mitochondria or the, the powerhouse of the cell. So within their cells, they have these little organelles that are producing energy. They produce chemical energy. And what these animals have is a protein that can convert that chemical energy into light, into light energy. And that's how these guys are actually producing light on their own. And it's crazy to think that these animals that are considered so simple and like just silly old jellies are able to make their own light, something that we are not able to do ourselves. Um, and one of the things that's really cool about these guys, what I like to bring this up, is because if you ever know that there's a tenophore bloom going on, if you know there's an area where there's a lot of tenophores, if you go there at night, either for a nice little swim or maybe for a paddle or something like that, you can just be covered in this absolutely stunning like array of colors around you. It's usually just kind of like greenish, bluish. Um, sometimes it's that nice purple that you see there, but it can just be so, so cool to see these guys generating their own light. And really all you have to do to get them to light up is to disturb the water around them and you get this like beautiful light show in front of you. And that's all I have for the Tina Fours. I'll maybe take us quickly just into the flatworms because I know I'm way over time already. Um, yeah, so next we have the flatworms. But in order to understand what a flatworm is, we kind of have to understand what any of the worms are. So we have three basic categories of worms. You have your round worms or your nematodes. Now these are essentially, you know, imagine like when you're a kid, you have Play-Doh and you just kind of, um, you know, move the Play-Doh in between your hands, like you, you kind of move your hands back and forth and you create like what is to you like a snake or something like that. That's basically what a roundworm is. There is not much to them. They are super, super, super simple animals. But they are maybe the most ubiquitous of the animals, by which I mean these are found on absolutely every single habitat on Earth that we know of. You can go into the middle of the desert and find nematodes. You can go to those, the bottom, I mean, the bottom, bottom of the ocean, like those really deep sea areas where it's insane pressure, sometimes even next to those like hydrothermal vents, and you can find nematodes. You can go to the top of a mountain and find nematodes. Any body of water probably has nematodes. Um, these guys tend, to, like, most of the nematodes that you will ever interact with in your life um, are probably those parasites, like what we talked about before. Um, and so most of these are, in fact, parasites. And what that means is that they um, essentially rely on, uh, like, feeding on other animals, if you would. Not in a predator sense where they're eating the whole animal, but they will, like, go inside the animal and like slowly suck away parts of it and eat away parts of it. So that's why when you have to like deworm your dog, you might be deworming them from nematodes. Um, so then you have your flatworms. And that's, I'll just talk about a couple flatworms today. But now imagine if you took those roundworms that you made with Play-Doh and you just flatten them in between your hands, then you have a flatworm. They're also incredibly simple. They don't have much going on in their body, um, but they're not nearly as ubiquitous as the nematodes. They are really, they're primarily found in bodies of water, both freshwater and seawater. Like the vast majority of them are found there, but you can find some on land. And some of these guys are also the parasites that, you know, your dog will get. 
Then the last group are the segmented worms, or the annelids. And this is a group that Shelby will be talking about next week in part two of this course. Um, but these are your segmented worms. So now maybe imagine if you had that Play-Doh roundworm that you made and you kind of just like made little sections of it. Um, that's pretty much what the annelids are. They're a lot more complex than the, the nematodes or the flatworms. They've got a lot more going on. They've got, you know, like cilia on the side. They, anyway, it doesn't matter. They've got a lot more complexity to them. To maybe put our knowledge to action, this is the common earthworm. Can anyone guess in the chat which of the three worms this is? Is this an annelid? Is this a nematode? Or is this a flatworm? I'm seeing a few answers. So this is in fact, this is in fact an annelid. It's a segmented worm. So you see all of these little segments all around it. That's a dead giveaway that this is not a flatworm or a roundworm. You also tell it has this whole separate looking structure right here. In, uh, the flatworms and your nematodes are not going to have anything as jazzy as this, right? It's not going to have anything as special as this common earthworm does. So instead, this is kind of what flatworms look like. Um, the reason I included this diagram is not because I want you to remember what any of these words are, but just kind of to say, you can pretty much sum up what this has and does in like six words, right? It's got its basic head area where it has things like eye spots that probably can't see very well and, and like chemosensory organs. It's got a little cavity where it does some digestion. It's got a single host hole that it both uses to eat and also to excrete from. And then it's got some very simple nerve cords. And that's kind of it. Um, but again, as I said, I think there is a real beauty in the simplicity here because these are guys have been around for so long and have done so well for themselves. They also can be insanely beautiful. So all of the ones on the right are examples of flatworms that you find in the ocean. We think that their coloration is to warn predators that they are poisonous or that they don't taste good or you shouldn't eat them. Whether that not that's true, who knows. Um, but just to say that these guys can be really, really nice to see because of how beautiful they are. They're only, oh, I, I also want to distinguish because there's lots of like cool, small, colorful things. Um, they are distinct from nudibranchs or sea slugs. So they are not nudibranchs or sea slugs. The examples that you see here are nudibranchs or sea slugs. So some of the things that you can do to try to identify, you know, if something is a nudibranch or a sea slug, first, you can look for this little crown shape. That crown shape is the exposed gills of the nudibranch. If it has, if it has these exposed gills, if it has that crown, not a flatworm. In addition, if it has these little like appendages on the back, sometimes called flabella, um, it's not a flatworm. This is again, way too jazzy for a flatworm. And similarly, if they have really, really distinct stalks in front, then they are not flatworms. Now this one can be a little bit confusing because they can have little eye stalks, but if they're really pronounced like this, um, then odds are what you're looking at is a, not a nudibranch or a sea slug. Instead, one of the, the flatworms that you will find in Florida is the tiger flatworm. Um, so these guys, they're really easy to spot because they are bright white and they have that really pretty, these really pretty like stripes that go right across um, the side. These stripes tend to be black, and then on the outside, kind of where the stripes end, you have this really nice orange coloration. Um, so I have only ever seen these look like these uh, photos on the left. They tend to be pretty small. I've only seen them maybe like the size of your fingernail or maybe your, that's your first knuckle, I'd say. Um, but apparently they can get much larger. Well, not much larger. They can maybe get to the size of your palm, I would say. And so you can see over on the right, that's a picture of a particularly large one. You can see it has those quite pronounced eye stalks, so it can be a little bit confusing. But when they grow to be quite large, um, their stripes can get much more complicated. And so they're not as distinct and easy to see like in the photos on the left, but they can just get a lot busier. Um, they also can sometimes be frilly. And again, I've never seen one that quite looks like this, but um, as you can see in the photo on the left, the kind of the edges of them are very frilly. And I think this is also when they get a little bit larger, they get that kind of you know, like ornateness to them. Now, something that's true of a lot of these invertebrates, um, uh, well, really the ones that Shelby will cover next week, um, when you're trying to find invertebrates, it's often easy to find them by looking for what they eat. And so in the case of the tiger flatworm, they pretty much exclusively eat orange tunicates. 
Now, tunicates, is a, tunicates are an animal that kind of look like somewhere between a sponge and a jelly. They kind of have that structure, like some of those simple sponges where they have their you know, main body and then, and then little holes, but they're not that spongy material. They, are, they tend to look more jelly-like, especially these orange tunicates. Um, as a very unnecessary aside, tunicates are actually chordates. So they are in that same phylum as vertebrates because at some point in their life, they develop like the equivalent of our spinal cord, not the skeleton, but the spinal cord itself. And it's just wild for me to think like we share a shocking amount of DNA with these little like tunicate guys. Anyway, aside, but if you look for these orange tunicates, oftentimes you can see some of these tiger flatworms, um, you know, milling about waiting to, uh, to munch on these guys. The last animal that I have for you today is the leopard flatworm. Um, so these are similarly pretty small. I think they only get to be about five centimeters in length maximum. Um, they're really distinct because they are this kind of dark black or really dark blue color, but they have covered all over them both orange and yellow dots. Then all the way around the edges, they tend to have the much smaller, but still like bright white dots. So if you ever see this kind of patterning with the small white dots on the side and the yellow and orange on this black body, odds are you're looking at one of these leopard flatworms. Now, generally speaking, these guys uh, like to hide. So you can only find them if you're peeking around in like very rubbly areas or underneath rocks. However, when they are exposed, when they're out on the reef, they tend to be a lot, uh, very active. So they move a lot, they'll scoot around the, the edge a lot. Um, you can tell, so, so similar to some of those pictures of the tiger flatworm, these guys have a very wavy side to them, and that's kind of always true with them. But it's really cool to see them moving around because they move those waves around. Um, and one of the really awesome things about flatworms, and especially these tiger flatworms, is that they can swim. And so the last thing that I'm going to do is show you guys a little video of these guys swimming because I think they are, they are absolutely beautiful. Um, and I think Shelby might drop a link to this in the chat, as you can see it as well. I hope you guys can see this right now, but I'm showing how the leopard flatworm swims. Um, these guys are sometimes, the whole group of flatworms are sometimes called Spanish dancers because of this movement that they have. Um, it's a little bit confusing because there is a Pacific species of uh, sea slug that moves in the same way, and it's bright red that's also called the Spanish dancer. I think that one makes more sense because it almost looks like one of those flamenco dancers moving with beautiful, you know, giant dresses. But um, just they're, they, they have the same method of locomotion, and I think just the way that they swim, people like to call them Spanish dancers. But um, yeah, I'm mostly just showing off how cool these guys are when they're out and they're swimming. They can use this if they're trying to, you know, escape predators on the bottom or if they're just trying to move to a new area, you know, to hide or to live. Um, but if you ever see these guys swimming, it's just an absolute pleasure to watch them. <laughs> and you see a curious fish. Okay. Well, we are at the almost end of our course. And so I just wanted to quickly go over, here's the groups that we talked about today. As I mentioned, these are the groups that are pretty low on that evolutionary tree. And so they're oftentimes considered simple animals sometimes even considered background animals. But I hope after today, not only will you be able to tell what these animals are when you see them, but maybe share in my excitement a little bit when you see them, know where to find them, know what creatures to look that they associate with, and maybe also spread this love around as part of Earth Month. Now next week, uh, Shelby is gonna cover uh, four different five love animals. These guys tend to be a little bit more complex, some people consider them a little more exciting, uh, but it includes your mollusks, which are things like your clams and your mussels, it also includes things like those sea slugs and sea snails, and it also includes things like sna uh, squid and uh, octopuses. She's also going to cover the segmented worms, those annelids. She's going to cover arthropods, those animals with jointed appendages. And then one of my favorite groups, the echinoderms, which are things like sea urchins and sea stars and sea cucumbers. But before I answer any more questions, we're going to do a quiz. And so for this quiz, all I'm going to ask you to do is I'm going to show you an animal. I'm going to maybe ask you a secondary question about it and just spam in the chat or yell at the screen or tell your dog what the answer is. It's really not important. But I do like it when you spam them in the chat because it's fun to see the answers. Okay, so the first one. I am looking for the common name and maybe even the scientific name of this animal 
And also, what is that clover shape at the top? Yeah, I'm seeing some good answers. Nice, nice. Heck yeah. So this is, this is your moon jelly. And that clover shape are its reproductive organs. They are the gonads. Way to go, y'all. Okay, so now a question. We're looking at two different animals here. I'm going to ask you, what are these animals? I just need that common name. And are they in the same phylum? Give you a little bit of extra time to make a fair amount of typing for this one. All right. Nice, nice, nice. Some good answers in there. So on the left, we have that red boring sponge, the Cleona Delatrix. Remember, that's the one that creates that corrosive material that can do that, that chemical warfare with the corals. And that is in the phylum Porifera, or pore bearing sponges. However, on the right, we have that palithoa, the zoanthid, in that stinging group, the cnidarians. So while these can look alike, they are not within the same phylum. Nice job, y'all. Okay, so I'm looking for the common name of this very beautiful creature. And if you'll recall, there are four distinct polyps that make up this animal. Do you remember what those polyps do? Yeah, some of the nice answers. <laughs> nice, nice. All right, so the common name here, yeah, nice. Okay, so the common name here, it's the Portuguese man of war. This is one of those siphonophores. It's four polyps. It has that gas-filled float at the top that's used for locomotion. It's got that digestive polyp that's right next to that reproductive polyp. And then it's got those stingy bits right at the bottom. Ah, oh, nice job, y'all. Let's see, why, you guys should be teaching this. I don't know what I'm doing doing this. All right. So now I'm wondering if you can remember the common name for this organism. I didn't give you the species name. I just gave you the general name for what this is. And I'm wondering if you can tell me, is this related to that last animal that we just saw? Well, they're all related. Is this in the same phylum? Is it one of those cnidarians? Nice, y'all. I also have to say I'm very impressed the uh, proper spelling of this group. <laughs> okay, so this is the comb jelly or the tinafore. And no, these guys do not have any of those stinging cells. So they're not cnidarians. They have none of those cnidocytes. Ah, really good job. Okay, so I am looking for the common name of this sponge. In addition to marine biologists, what other kind of scientists or researchers might be interested in this animal? Yeah, great job, y'all. So this is the red pore rope sponge. And it is of interest to biomedical researchers, uh, this species in, in particular, because it seems to have some properties that can fight against HIV. But, you know, we're seeing more and more biomedical researchers that are interested in the reef, reef organisms in general. Okay, so I'm looking for the common name of this little product. 
and I'm wondering if you remember, how does this get most of its energy? Does it get it from photosynthesis? Does it get it from feeding on animals or maybe both? <laughs> the wiggly squiggly. <laughs> I will accept that answer, Pamela. <laughs> All right, great job, y'all. So this is indeed the corkscrew anemone. And so this is one of those animals that does have those symbionts, those uh, algal, the algae that lives inside of its tissue, um, but it's also an active feeder. So this does heterotrophy, as we call it, or feeding, as well as photosynthesis. Okay, just a couple more for you here. I'm looking for the common name of this, and also if you even remember the genus name of this. And the hint on the right, uh, well, I included the photo on the right because maybe we'll jog your memory of that uh, genus name. <laughs> nice, nice, y'all. Exactly. So this is the fire coral. As a reminder, this is not a true coral. It's a bit of that misnomer, but it is a fire coral. And the genus name is Millipora, like those thousand pores that has so, so, so many of these tiny little polyps living all over the animal with that sting. And just a reminder, don't touch this uh, animal. It's got that pretty nasty sting. Okay, I lied. I think we have two more. Um, so I've got a question. Are these flatworms? Are they both flatworms? Is one a flatworm or are neither flatworms? To note, neither of these were shown in the presentation. I, I also think these are Pacific species. <laughs> so forgive me there, but I was thinking maybe, you know, if you're, if you're out diving or snorkeling in the Pacific, then maybe you can put the knowledge you learned here to use and figure out if you're ever looking at a, at a, at a flatworm or maybe something else, like a, like a deuteronk or a sea slug. Nice. You guys are honestly great at these. So what we have here is a nudibranch on the left and a flatworm on the right. So as a reminder, some things you can look out for these nudibranchs is you see this crown shape in the back. Those are the gills. And up here, these are actually not eye stalks. They're um, two little organs that they're, they sense chemicals in the water. Over here, we do have the flatworm. So you see how it's super flat. It doesn't have that, I mean, these are the kind of little eye stalks in the front, but they're not really that pronounced. There's no real body cavity to it. Um, and it's just very simple and straightforward. There you got your flatworm. Okay, and last but not least, we have, I'm looking for the common name of this wonderful animal. And I want y'all to guess, what is the name of the study of, uh, I'm kind of giving it away here, but what is the name of the study of Sponges. Just take a wild guess. <laughs> you guys are great at guessing. Honestly, I, I include this in the presentation. I, I used to include this at the beginning of the presentation and say if there's only one thing I want you to remember, it's that the study of sponges is honestly called spongiology. But anyway, the last animal that I had for you today is the giant barrel sponge, that Zestospongia muta, the, these redwoods of the reef, my favorite sponges out there. So that's all that I have for you today. Honestly, thank you so much for joining me. It's an absolute pleasure. I love doing stuff like this. Um, I, it's for me, just the perfect way to celebrate Earth Month, to kind of uh, spend more time than I was supposed to, sharing my love of all these critters with you. 
And my honest, honest hope is that next time you're out on the reef, maybe don't just go buy a sponge and think, oh, that's a sponge, but be like real excited about these sponges and these other animals there. They're so cool. They're so important to our reefs. Um, and yeah, thank you so much. Uh, I'll stick around for as long as y'all want to answer questions. I've, you know, got nowhere to go in this quarantine. Um, but if you got to drop off, no problem. And uh, very honestly, thank you so much for joining. And definitely check out the rest of the presentations that we have this month. And happy, happy, happy Earth Month. Thanks, Maurizio. I always love your enthusiasm. I'm scrolling frantically through the questions because they kind of turned into the quiz answers, and it's a little hard um, to <laughs> pick things out. <laughs> but um, <laughs> I think someone asked why earthworms um, escape from people's lawns and go on to sidewalks. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I often joke, so I often joke, you know, with my friends, we, uh, you know, there's, we've, my friends do a whole lot of different things, you know, I've got like lawyers and doctors and all that stuff, and so I feel like a lot of uh, nature questions has come to me, but I always have to respond, I know like nothing about land and stuff, I'm very much an ocean dude, so anything I told you about common earthworms is, you know, a complete guess on my behalf. Um, I do know that they can't breathe underwater, so if it like rains a lot, the reason that they come up is because they need to breathe. Um, but that's probably as much as I know about earthworms. <laughs> yeah, um, we actually so there was a there were a couple questions earlier that asked about good resources for um, Caribbean reef organism ID, and I sent out the Paul Human and Ned Deloach books, but I didn't know if you had any other sources that you like. Um, those are my favorite. Those books are phenomenal. Um, they they have so many different species in there. You can get ones that are specific to different kind of organisms. So they right, they have like the invert one, they have a fish one, they have a stony coral one. Um, those are my go-to resources, definitely. Otherwise, it's tuning into presentations like this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, Chelsea and... Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Yeah, actually, it's Mary Lou. There's a couple of great apps online, too. The Reef Life apps are awesome, and you can actually target them uh, for what area you're exploring or where you live in. And I love also the Paul Human uh, books as well. But if you're an avid iPhone user or smartphone user, I strongly recommend the Reef Life apps. Thanks, Mari Lou. Really good feedback, especially those books can get kind of pricey, so an app is a nice way to start out. Um, trying to see if there's anything else to do. Yeah, I'll admit I just wrote that down as well. That was my silence. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> a lot of people have asked if they can have a link to the presentation or if um, the slides are available is this being recorded can you speak to that a little bit for sure i know that this is being recorded and the recording will go out i think to all the folks who registered at some point after um and i'm more than happy to provide these slides uh it's a pretty large pdf uh PDF powerpoint so i don't know if i can send it uh let me see if i can figure out a way to like pdf it in a way that works um and then we can figure out a way to distribute those but absolutely 